Hi everyone, I'm your host, Arlen Schumer, and welcome to one of my pop culture presentations. Get ready to be both educated and entertained, what I call edutainment. And when you're done, please be sure to click the subscribe or follow button on your platform screen to be notified of all of my upcoming pop culture presentations. Without a doubt, the year 1967 was one of the greatest years in the decade of the 1960s. And according to this author, it was the year of fire and ice. There was fire in the Middle East and Vietnam and the birth of the counterculture. In films, Warren Beatty gave us the first countercultural gangster film where the villains were the heroes. The Graduate showed us sex, marriage, and adultery like we had never seen it before. Of course, there was still conventional cinema, but there were serious films like In the Heat of the Night, the star Sidney Poitier broke racial ground. The same year, he was in Deserved Love with its great title song sung by the British pop star Lulu when it hit the top of the charts, which was the year pop music exploded. So many great artists and great albums, but all were dwarfed by the Beatles' psychedelic masterpiece, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which they followed up a month later performing All You Need Is Love for a worldwide satellite broadcast. Just a week before, the one and only Jimi Hendrix debuted to the American audience at the groundbreaking Monterey Pop Festival famously lighting his guitar on fire. And the Jimi Hendrix of Comfort Of course, it was Jim Steranko. He took the artistic zeitgeist of the time, which was the psychedelic poster art of Peter Max, and brought it to his Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. And not only were his covers psychedelic, but his interior pages Layouts, compositions, and effects blew our collective comics consciousness. And the only artist who kept pace with Steranko was Neil Adams. The same year Steranko did his S.H.I.E.L.D. masterpieces, Adams in the pages of DC Comics' Dead Man spun similar psychedelic magic and ladies and gentlemen that's what we're here to celebrate the second of my seven memorial webinars about dead man it was his comic book series that made neil adams bones so thank you ladies and gentlemen for being here for dead man neil adams and the shock of the new my name is Arlen Schumer. Oops, sorry. Okay, there we go. I did a book about comic art in the 1960s and how it reflected what was happening in the decade at the time. And of course, Neil Adams was one of the main chapters. And he passed away about two weeks ago. And I knew that I had to do a, not just one, but a series of memorial webinars. When I looked at the Wednesdays following his passing away, I realized I could do one a week because I like to do them on Wednesday. And the last one would be on June 15th, which would be Neil Adams would have been Neil Adams' 81st birthday. So again, thank you folks for being here. My name is Arlen Schumer. And yes, I call it Neil Adams and the shock of the new dead man. Now, dead man, of course, first appeared here in this panel on this page from Neil Adams' third issue of the title, dated January 1968, but comics are dated three months in advance. Ergo, uh, this cover appeared in November, 
maybe late October even. So it was just a couple months earlier in the summer of 67. This is not by Neil Adams. This is by the artistic creator of Dead Man, the great Carmine Infantino. This appears again, it's dated October of 67. So I remember it came on sale in August and we had never seen a character that looked quite like this. I mean, that face alone. Now, not to mention the, the legend there, the man who was murdered is our hero. His story begins one minute later. Well, in this double page spread in my book, The Silver Age of Comic Book Art, I show you writer Arnold Drake's original sketch that he gave to Carmen Infantino for how he envisioned Dead Man. Now, Arnold Drake was the writer. We're going to talk about him in a moment. But, you know, there was this character in South America. Uh, these were um, kind of like graphic stories with this character, Diabolique. And I think it started to appear in 1962. Um, but then in 1966, a year before Dead Man appears in Batman, Gil Kane draws this cover of the villain Death Man, he was called. And it was a year later that in South America, they put Diabolique, the comic stories to film and he looked like this. So it's interesting when we see how that goes back to Arnold Drake's, you know, circa 1966 slash 67. Um, drawing there. Now, if we scoot over, you can see the half page house ad, as they were called, appearing in DC Comics. See, August 29th. I was right. Beautifully hand-lettered by the great Irish Snap. But let's take a little dive into who this dead man character was. If you just read the dialogue written by Drake, and you can see in Carmen Infantino's very raw artwork, just the visage of dead man and the words he's saying, he, we, we identify with his, his um, lady friend here, Stop it, Boston. I can't stand it when you talk and look that way. That costume and makeup. I mean, that's how we, the readers, felt looking at this. But so Dead Man's this daredevil acrobat who performs without a net. See, the man who nightly pits his very life against the fates. Dead Man. Well, mid-swing, he gets shot. Beautiful stylized art by Carmen Infantino. One of the last full art jobs he would do before, well, we're gonna talk about that. But instead of dying on the ground, dead man seems to get up. He's not dead. And he walks to the light. Again, beautifully stylized Infantino paddle with a great coloring. He goes outside of the circus tent and in the midst of the thunder and lightning, this Indian spirit, Ramakrishna, says you shall have the power to walk among men until you have found the one who killed you. Well, this was writer Arnold Drake being very hip to what was happening circa 1966-67. You know, this was the era that the Beatles went to visit the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi in India, which was covered by the world media. There's Arnold Drake, actually at the signing when my the original edition of my book came out, 2003. I think he passed away maybe about, I'm gonna say a dozen years ago, maybe. I'm not sure, but Arnold Drake is famous for creating DC's Doom Patrol in 1963. And by 66, 67, when he comes up with Dead Man, it was really an attempt to, you know, try to convince DC, you got to do something new to deal with the rising tide of Marvel Comics. And 
Drake's answer was dead man and he got Infantino to draw it. Now, of course, the fact that his killer has a hook for a hand. Well, the same summer of 67, Dead Man Debuts, it was the last episode of the ABC television drama, The Fugitive with David Jansen in the background there on the hunt for the one-armed man who killed his wife, labeling him a fugitive, falsely accused. This series debuted in the fall of 63. Uh, and the finale in which he catches the one-armed killer, you can see here in the still, that aired in August of 67, was at the time the most watched television show ever. So as you can see from this house ad from Marvel Comics, they would soon, it, technically by the early 70s, they would overtake DC Comics purely in sales. But it was Marvel Comics that grabbed the media attention. This is the 1966 spread in Esquire magazine, the first full color media coverage in a consumer magazine of the rise of Marvel Comics. Now, DC's leading artist, Carmen Infantino, right after he does that, the first Dead Man, is basically promoted from being their top artist, which you can see here in this memorial issue DC did for him, reprinting his greatest hits. But he was the first comic book artist to be promoted to an executive position. Initially, it was the head of DC, Erwin Donenfeld, the son of Harry, one of the founders, along with Jack Leibowitz of DC Comics, hired Infantino to really art direct all of DC's covers because it was his covers for the titles he drew, like The Flash and Batman, that outsold all the other DC covers. And Erwin Donenfeld was a big believer that covers drove sales. But within a year, Infantino went from essentially art director to publisher. And in this house ad that he drew himself, he was also kind of charged by Donenfeld with coming up with new ideas for DC, again, to really compete with what was happening over at Marvel with Jack Kirby and then Jim Steranko hit the scene in 66, 67. Well, the greatest new thing that came to DC did not come in a sense from Infantino, it came from this guy. Neil Adams, probably younger here than when he was 26 in 1967, when he got to DC Comics. This is probably from the time, I'm gonna say, when he got the job to draw a comic strip based on the ABC TV show, Ben Casey, classic medical show, uh, Vince Edwards and Sam Jaffe as Dr. Gillespie, his aged mentor. Well, it was Adam's facility with photorealism that got him the job, but he was the youngest artist at the age of 21 in 1962 to get a nationally syndicated comic strip. There were comic artists twice and three times his age that were laboring their whole careers to get a national comic strip. Look at the way the National Cartoonist Society gave him a little bio. I think this was in the book, uh, Cartoonist Cookbook or something like that, believe it or not. Um, I might be wrong, but there's a little quick bio. In my first webinar, I did a full Neil origin story, so to speak. But this pretty much, if you're reading the dialogue, encapsulates um, what he was, uh, his background leading to Ben Casey. And what he did with Ben Casey, as you can see here in this mock-up, is he used photo reference of himself as Ben Casey. <laughs> he didn't have pictures of Vince Edwards. And his first wife, the late Corey Adams, shown there in the upper right corner. And you can see how Adams drew her into the strip as well. Right from the start with Ben Casey, as you can see in these two samples, he was trying to burst the bounds of the limitations of the daily comic strip, which most artists, whether they were doing cartoony stuff or realistic stuff, usually did four panels in that rectangular format. But you can see in these two samples, 
especially the bottom sample. Are you kidding me? Uh, again, this is like 1960. What year? This is 1966. Copyright. It was a couple of years earlier that they gave him a Sunday strip in addition to the daily. Again, I'm not sure exactly what year the Sunday strip debuted. Um, okay. Was that 1963, maybe? Doesn't matter. But again, look at this sample, maybe his most famous Ben Casey Sunday, called the Hidden Head Strip, colloquially, where you can see that he split up the large Ben Casey head into separate narrative panels. So the young Neil Adams, you know, 24 years old here in 1965, is really pushing the limits of what he could do in a daily and Sunday comic strip, graphically and artistically. Well, in 1966, that was the year that they canceled the Ben Casey television show. So the comic strip got canceled too. This is from Neil Adams' last strip, See You in the Funny Papers. Well, after the strip ended in 66, Neil Adams went out into the New York City commercial art world as a commercial artist. Notice this promotion piece of his own. Again, heavily based on photo reference figures. Here's an example. I'm not sure whether this was originally in color. All I ever have in my files is the black and white. But you can see, again, very realistic photo reference for the hospital scene, of course. And then, believe it or not, he loses his illustration portfolio or it gets stolen. You know, in those days, you dropped off your big leather portfolio at the ad agencies. They would look at it, theoretically, and three days later, you'd go to pick it up. So maybe it disappeared that way. I know years later, he lost some Green Lantern pages in the subway. Uh, those are, you know, two uh, bad days for Neil Adams. But having lo lost his illustration portfolio, that gives him the incentive to go to DC Comics in 1966-67 and um, begin his comic book career there, which was really the best thing to happen to Carmen Infantino at the same time. In a twist of fate, Adams becomes Carmen Infantino's, in a sense, company muse, if I can coin such a word, that Infantino made sure all of DC's editors immediately used this incredible talent, which made the 26-year-old Neil Adams very happy. Now, because Carmen Infantino could not draw a dead man anymore, guess who got the gig? You can see here, based on Neil Adams' signature, if you know your Neil Adams, there's his early signature and later signature, and that's usually the telltale sign that this has to be an early sketch um, from when Neil Adams started on the character. Now, here's something I only found recently on the internet, but it's a fascinating document. Uh, classic Neil Adams hand lettering. Uh, you know, I worked with Neil, that's a whole nother story. But I would say based on what he's writing, and I'm sure you're reading this as I'm talking to you, because I'm giving you the time to read it. In fact, why don't we go up close so that you can really read it? This to me look, looks like when Neil Adams got the job, this was his own kind of creative brief to use ad agency lingo, kind of laying out, maybe he's feeding this back to the editor, Jack Miller, who was also writing the stories after Arnold Drake wrote only the first issue. Acrobat Dead Man, the greatest heiress in the world, is assassinated by a man with a hook on his left arm. He died in his Dead Man costume, and as the goddess Ramakushna, see, I think Neil Adams made sure she was a goddess. I don't know if in the beginning issues uh, it's stated like that. Anyway, he brings him back to semi-life. He remains in costume, intangible and invisible. His only ability is to merge with another living person and take over their body. As he searches for his murderer world over, he runs into many other criminals and crimes. This concept should be handled very seriously, emphasis mine, and very realistically. 
with a concentration on a different individual, I'm not sure if I'm reading the right, acting each week, such as the greatest acrobat, acrobat on earth. Okay, maybe the end got there a little fouled up. But again, this only recently surfaced after Neil passed away. And um, until I know further, I'm, I'm maintaining this was Neil's, maybe one of his first drawings of Dead Man. Here's another great early sketch. Again, you can tell by the signature. But man, what a beautiful drawing and just sums up kind of maybe in one figure the Neil Adams approach, dynamic yet realistic anatomy, a master of foreshortening and perspective, and then his dealing with lights and darks, shading, spotting of blacks, as it's called, is unparalleled. Well, his first issue of Dead Man wasn't even, didn't even have a cover drawn by him. This is the old standby DC artist, Mike Sikowski, in all his stylized glory. Mike Sikowski, he was the artist for Justice League of America for the last, you know, seven years when he drew this dead man cover. So what, where was Neil Adams? Well, here's the opening page, the opening uh, splash page, as it's called. Now, to those of you that don't know the comic book breakdown of work, you know, one artist often only pencils a story, another artist inks it with India ink, then other colorists prepare the color guides and that's how and of course the lettering has to be done by letterer usually after the penciling and before the inking well the inks are by an old-time dc anchor named george russo and all i can say is neil adams so disliked what russo's inks did to his pencils that when this story was reprinted in 2005 for a very special slipcase edition, Adams went back to, I don't think he had his original pencils. He took black and white reproductions of Russo's inks of his pencils and re-penciled and re-inked the entire story. So it looked like this, for instance, the splash page now look like this. This was the 2005 slipcase edition reprint of the complete Neil Adams Dead Man. I would call it a must-have double bag item if you don't have the originals. But yeah, once again, look at Neil Adams 2005 circa revise. Like I said, repenciled, inked, and colored compared to the Russo original. Now, Maybe you don't see how, quote, bad this is unless you look at the individual pages. Now, maybe you have to be uh, more familiar with not only Neil's work, but comic art in general to know why these are considered terrible inks. So terrible that once again, Neil went to the black and white Russo ink pages both re-penciled and inked new drawings and had it newly colored on the computer for the 2005 edition. Now, this story with the bikers is something that early Neil had to be fascinated with. You know, this was 1967, the year of many of the Hells Angels type films that came out from the famous exploitation house, American International. Um, and you can see in some of Neil's 1968 covers for DC Comics. Now, when I do the Superman Ali webinar, I believe that's June 8th, I'll be doing all of Neil's Superman work, which includes all of the covers he did at the same time he was doing Dead Man. He was doing all of Mort Weisinger's Superman family covers. So there's another biker cover. So look at the last 
page of Neil's first story. And again, look at the DC tendency back then to end the story on a half page so they could sell another half page ad. In this case, this is just a house ad. But I mean, can you imagine a movie ending? And when you get to the last image on the screen, it moves up halfway and there's an ad. But that's what, you know, young Neil had to deal with. But look at the inking of Russo. And then as I dissolve, oh, I'm sorry, as we move in, I want you to notice the bare bones inking of Russo compared to what Neil Adams does in 2005. So Infantino was really pushing Neil Adams, even in their house ads, direct currents uh, in every issue of DC Comics about their up and coming releases. That's one of Neil's first Batman covers over a Carmen Infantino layout. If you know your Infantino stances, the Robin in the background, the guy punching Batman, and of course the ragged Batman that Infantino liked to draw all of his characters at one time or another. But notice in the bottom of the house ad, we get Neil's first dead man cover, which let's look at better versus the house ad is really the cover that startled us all, appearing in the fall of 1967. We had never seen a cover like this at DC Comics. An artist with the facility to draw that many different faces and genders and, and races, ages. And not only that, but if you strip down the color, it was also his inking style, especially his spotting of blacks to indicate shiny red dark fabric that would handle shadows like that. Now, Neil, of course, to the comic book audience that was unaware of his background, having done Ben Casey for four and a half years, that's where Neil Hone, you can see in this example of his last pay, his last Sunday, just the inking alone is skills he mastered in the art of the realistic comic strip, descended from the masters like Alex Raymond and, and um, uh, Stan uh, Drake, who was an acolyte of Alex Raymond, and Neil Adams was an acolyte of Stan Drake. And again, if I did a Ben Casey webinar, there's a lot of material there for how Neil Adams basically honed his skills of human expressions. Look at all the different people in this one Sunday, an old woman in the top, a young, beautiful woman, bottom left, the older man, the younger man, Ben Casey, self-portrait. Well, that's what he brought to Dead Man. And if you, now, these are Neil's inks, not George Russo, by the way. And you can just see as you read the dialogue, that you're feeling the emotions of the dialogue. Now remember, Jack Miller, the editor, wrote this story. But Neil Adams, like the, an auteur of film, is bringing it to life. In fact, you know, color is almost redundant with, with Neil's art because his inking is so beautiful. But notice in his recapitulation of Dead Man's Origin, remember, Neil inherits this from Carmen Infantino. But in just this one panel, you can see the difference between Neil Adams' realism, though there's stylization there, compared to Infantino's stylization. This is what separated Neil from what we began to see was all other comic artists was this this realism that we had never seen in comic characters before. His next cover for his next issue, I was 10 years old when this came out. Actually, not even 10 yet. I would turn 10 in 1968. So this is January of 68. Again, on sale in late fall of 67. So I remember as a nine and a half year old staring at this cover at that purple magenta, I didn't know the word magenta at the time, I don't think, 
But I remember staring at this cover for seemingly hours, wondering how he did it. Well, of course, found out, you know, years later as we got older, that this was something he learned working in commercial advertising before he got to comics. You prepare the art you want as what's called a color hold on a separate paper or acetate overlay, beautiful ink dead man face. And then you give instructions to the printer to print the black plate when you print your magenta ink. Comics are a four color process, cyan, yellow, magenta, and black, red, yellow, blue, and black basically. And that's how Neil Adams was able to achieve something we hadn't seen in mainstream DC or Marvel comics. Of course, the following year or so, when Neil Adams would also go to Marvel comics, he would bring the same type of effects. And I'm gonna be talking about X-Men in depth, uh, I think in webinar number four after Batman, I think, is Marvel works. But yeah, so that's what made this cover startling. And the interiors, you can see where Neil Adams, again, in a recapitulation of Dead Man's Origin, um, I guess they felt that each issue Dead Man was brand new, they were getting new readers. But you can see that Neil Adams layout wise is really trying to break the mold of what had been done before. Having done syndicated strips for four and a half years, he described the freedom of having the whole page just so liberating graphically and artistically. And as he said, he just busted out. And then his use of what's called Zipatone, clear plastic film printed with dots to put on the black and white art and make it gray so that when you would add color, you would get this type of lighting effect. And Neil was an early master of that. So you have the combination of just beautiful graphic stylization, inking, but yet realistic. With a little cartooning in there with the motion of his head. And, you know, these are little touches that make you feel that dialogue. Look at this fight scene. You know, we hadn't seen realistic punches that looked like real punches and people getting punched suffering from the physics of the recoil of that punch i love the dead man figure in the upper right panel i mean they're all great you can really feel dead man yanking the nose piece of the eagle's cowl and then when you turn the page, this might be Neil's first double page spread at DC Comics. Well, I think it was definitely his first double page spread for Dead Man. And there you can see again the Zipatone on the top giant panel. And when you read that dialogue, you can feel that dialogue because of Neil's illustrative or tourist abilities to bring that dialogue to life with an emotion and a power like really we had never seen before. Sorry, I should have shown you. Yeah, there it is in black and white. There's your Zipatone, sorry folks. You know, this is the first time I'm doing this webinar. This is really like a dress rehearsal. If I were to do it again, I'd get it all perfect. But you know, I'm happy to have you as my audience in on this dress rehearsal, but yes, enjoy the beauty of Neil's black and white art and his application of Zipatone and the way it ends up looking. And we're gonna talk about coloring, but I've gotta believe Neil also colored these dead mans, probably uncred, well, they didn't even give credits back then for colorists, DC Comics didn't. And uh, neither did Marvel, they didn't credit the colorists, right? They, yeah, just the letterer. The following issue, another dramatic cover. Now, folks, if you know anything about drawing, you know, making the back of a guy, in a sense, the focus of the picture to make you feel that body falling, 
but knowing where to put the lines, knowing where and how material creases when it gets tucked in, the muscles underneath the shirt that you can feel in the way Neil Adams inks those ridges and, and um, mounds in his back. But like almost every drawing of Neil Adams in his peak is a masterclass in the art of realistic drawing. So let's open the cover to this. How about this logo type image that you're met with? Dead man, world's greatest aerialist. Okay. It's like an old guy with a rolled up poster in his hand, maybe. Oh, he's the sign guy. Okay. Let's turn the page. Whoa. The eagle. How did he become the world's greatest aerialist? Now, you see that great drawing of the old man in the foreground? How great is that? That's actually Neo doing a character of the man who would become his soulmate inker and his business partner in the early 70s in the studio in New York City that Neil dubbed Continuity Associates. And you can see in this house ad to promote, or I should say self-promotional illustration to give out to the New York City ad agency community that if you need storyboards, if you need what are called comps, if you need anything, come to continuity. Well, this was like, you know, Joe Kubert started his school, but continuity would prove to be Neil Adams' school. Man, again, I could do a whole webinar just on the history of continuity and the alumni that come out. I'm actually one of them in a long line, but everybody from Bill Sienkiewicz to Frank Miller to so many other presently working professionals, Larry Hama, all came out of the continuity associate um, time spent there. So that's who Neo was caricaturing as the old man. And this issue features one of Neo's greatest pages that again made everybody in the comic book reading audience sit up and take notice. Who is this guy doing these incredible pages in which on the one hand you follow dead man's body as it soars over the scene and eventually takes over the body of uh, Pete, one of the hands. Now, Neil Adams was a student of comic art in a sense, even though there weren't any real books at the time other than Jules Pfeiffer's book, maybe. But Neil Adams was aware of what had been done in comic strips earlier. Gasoline Alley by Frank King. He often did his Sunday strips as one giant scene that he laid a grid over. And like, you know, people talk about comics as film on paper. As you follow it narratively, left to right, top to bottom, you see that it's a character continuing in that scene broken up in time by the panels. King was a master. Every now and then, he would do another version of the same idea, uh, this being a mini masterpiece of a page. But I believe Neil Adams was aware of this and incorporated it into his comic book work. Now, you know, this is late 67 that Neil Adams is drawing. During this time, for the past year and a half, over at Marvel Comics, Jim Steranko was, again, he was dubbed the Jimi Hendrix of comics because he was doing not only psychedelic imagery before Neil Adams, but he was pacing stories also kind of like film on paper because you can see the buildup on this page when you turn it. They're hit with this incredible double page spread, which is really one of Steranko's epitomes. I think everything that 
anybody loves about Steranko is in this one double page spread. But it epitomizes his Kirby on acid or Kirby on steroids style that he incorporated into the supercharged psychedelia of Steranko, as I call it. But, you know, a couple months later, Neil Adams over in Dead Man, I mean, a couple months after that sequence appeared, I believe this sequence by Neil Adams appears. Again, the way he divides up time and builds suspense as Eagle vaults up the carousel. Uh, no, not carousel. Uh, what's it called? The, the, the big wheel. The big wheel? The Ferris wheel. I'm an idiot. But in terms of pacing, watch what happens when you turn the page. Boom. Now, folks, I don't think Neil had photo reference of a Ferris wheel from that angle. You've got to know how to draw. Maybe he did have photo reference. I don't know. I never asked him. I wish I had. I had. But this page, this spread is just really a masterpiece on so many levels um, that, again, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am enjoying presenting it. And then you turn the page, and here's Neil, just a great comic book storyteller. And just using the panel shapes themselves to get across the dynamics of the narrative action itself, which is what, as a teacher, you try to instill in young artists, this is how you use panel shapes to help you get across what you want the reader to see and feel. So great bookend to the cover, which was the drop from the exact other angle. What's also interesting about this issue is up until issue 209, Jack Miller, the editor, did not feature a letters page until this page appears. Strange but true. Well, I don't want to take time reading the first column, but he basically comes to the decision that, you know, the name of the one who turns in the winning tonight, we're talking about the letter column. But look at this first letter that he prints. Dear editor, after having read comics for over 16 years, I can honestly say that Dead Man is, without a doubt, the greatest character I've ever seen. The concept is tremendous. The story was the old-fashioned hit him in the guts type that has long been needed in comics. The art, well, it was the greatest. Never did I expect such an adult theme in a comic mag. And your handling of it was unbeatable. In ending letters of this kind, most writers say, keep up the good work. I'm not going to. I'm sure you know exactly what you've got hold of. Don't change it. Marvin Wolfman is, you know, in the Hall of Fame in comics history, still working in Los Angeles, famous writer for DC Comics and Marvel. Um, you know, his list of accomplishments is a long one, but he's the first fan to get a letter printed about, I mean, notice the next letter, just start off. I must send my comments for the new creation, Dead Man. The plot and handling at a human touch a reader can feel. I'm sure I joined with the many thousand comic fans chatting. You know, comic fandom, there were like a handful of fanzines. What was comic fandom? It was what you read in these letter columns. Well, here's the next issue. And interesting cover. I'm just going to shrink it a little bit. Look at the black on Dead Man's costume. It's not as black. It's it's lighter somehow. And remember, Dead Man's a ghost. So interesting graphic effect Neil got. Well, how did he do it? He put white zipatone over the black ink portions of Dead Man's costume and achieve this effect when it got printed with the pink color. 
inside another graphic beauty where dead man in full color starts reading a backstory and Adams renders it in beautiful black and white with zip tone added. And once again, you can feel the punch of that panel in the middle right. Oof, no more, no more. Neil doesn't really show you the punch, but you feel it because he's a master of drawing. You feel the blackjack or the back of the gun hitting that guy's head. But remember, as Robert Crumb would say, folks, it's only lines on paper. How about this page? This is, again, what Neil Adams brought to comics. The foreshortening, yet realistic drawing. In other words, in real life, I'm sure, you know, that's not what a hand... I'm talking about in the top right panel of the guy punching dead man with a glow around him in the green suit. That's dead man. But the fist of that guy, that's Neil Adams' combination of cartooning with realism. Now, look at the first panel. You can feel the chunk of that fist hitting the guy's face in the way Adams' realistic, yet again, kind of stylized cartooniness, and the heavy spotting of black to give you the feel of that punch. And then you turn the page and a full page where, and again, comics are also about the mixture of dynamic lettering. Remember the Batman TV show with the pilots and the zaps? Well, there's Neil's crash. And again, you, you can really kind of feel that and the squawks of the pigeons being burst out of the cage as dead man's body that he's occupying bursts into it. Now, speaking of realism with stylization, here's something we had never seen in a DC comic, a house ad that looked like this, that Neil Adams drew out again in beautiful black and white. And that's again, a combination of stylization, the background figure is realistic yet also stylized. And then the realistic vignettes, but again, the spotting of blacks on the central figure, beautiful. And that's something he would bring to the next issue of Dead Man when he had the graphic boldness to show us an entire white silhouetted figure on a full color cover. I mean, no one in comics had done anything that looked like this. So his command of realism gave us a realistic shadow that made us feel this two-dimensional drawing in a third dimension that's not really there, but we feel it because of his mastery of drawing. Now, remember what that reader said about the realism of the stories. This particular story could have been torn from today's headlines as dead man finds himself on the border of Mexico dealing with immigrants being illegally shuttled over the border into the U.S. Folks, this is 1968 in D.C. comics. And Jack Miller is able to write. Remember Neil Adams in his creative brief said, you've got to handle this seriously. Well, thanks to Neil Adams' realistic art, Miller was able to write stories. Here's Dead Man trying to tell his rescuers that they've got to haul up that line because one of the immigrants' innocence is on the other end of it. Well, you turn the page. Again, look at the realism, yet the cartooniness at the same time. That ear is just beautifully drawn. But the ability to blacken out the entire face, yet keep those slight highlights and then you turn the page and you see this panel the beauty of the monochromatic simple coloring the delineation of light and shadow the almost hemingway like simplicity of the dialogue okay guys let's go home 
I mean, this is what made Neil Adams bones. You don't need any dialogue or writing at all to feel what dead man's feeling after the end of a story like that, where you don't have a happy ending. He doesn't save the day. People die. But then he gives us this panel to end the story, which again, the combination of realism and exaggeration. I mean, Jack Kirby had exaggeration, but not realism. Neil Adams had the realism and the exaggeration at the same time, which was a potent combination. And that's why you feel the sound effect arc. Every issue, it was like, what is Neil Adams going to do this issue to top himself? So how about this beautiful composition? But you might think, okay, but where is the Dead Man Strange Adventures logo going to go? If he's got all that activity at the top. But again, let us just admire just what's going on in this drawing and how beautifully inked it is. Again, the spotting of blacks, not only a dead man's costume, but on the hook. The, the daringness and the confidence to put entire black shapes within the figure, like in the hook's chest and in his pants. That is what Neil Adams brought to comics. Artists in comics at DC Comics did not spot blacks like that. But... Graphic design-wise, how great is that? I mean, that's just startling, incredible, beautiful. Yeah, one of the one of Neil Adams' great covers, and beautifully colored. Again, I've got to believe Neil Adams colored this. The 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 tones that he was able to get. Look at the ground and the gradation from foreground to background, and how it gets lighter how the sky in the background goes from yellow to orange with dead man's bright red in the middle. I mean, this is just really a masterpiece. This particular story introduces us to dead man's twin brother, Cleveland brand. Yes. Boston brand. Dead man has a twin brother, Cleveland brand. And you can see in the story, they're both somehow trapped. Well, Cleveland is and Dead Man's the Ghost. Classic caught in the cage with a lion. And once again, Neil Adams' combination of <clears throat> dynamic action, realistic anatomy, the ability to draw animals in the positions you want them in with foreshortening. Look at that first panel. And then designing your page to not only get across the frantic action that's happening, but graphically just designing each panel to communicate the information you want. And then Neil's awareness that sound, you know, there's a soundtrack in comics. The comics are a silent medium. So the way you manipulate lettering and type. So between the panel design, the type, the action, again, just this is the young Neil Adams making his bones and blowing our minds. Once again, in this last panel of the story, the combination of the stylization of the background brushstrokes with the realism of the figure, yet the stylized position. And thank you again, DC Comics, for selling a beer wagon ad underneath Neil's great drawing. I'm, I'm sure Neil just loved it when he saw this in print. This was the issue that also debuted the letter writer, Carl Gafford, who would go on to become a professional at DC Comics. And he, I think, was awarded uh, whatever the original art, whatever Jack Miller promised him. And Neil Adams penciled and ink the letter column, Dead Man's Chest, which seems obvious, but hey, the obvious choice is the one to go with. How about this house ad? Lettered not by Irish Snap, but by his successor, Gaspar Saladino. 
who I believe is the Salieri to Irish Schnapps Mozart, but that's a subject for another webinar. But yes, this particular picture lived up to the ad hype that one picture is worth a thousand words. Because once again, I remember staring at this, going, what is that weird effect that Neil Adams got in the background of this incredible image? Well, I had to wait till the cover came out. I mean, the issue came out after the ad. And man, just another masterpiece. Now, that background effect is called a mezzotint which are screens printed in black on acetate that printers shoot, meaning photograph, a pencil drawing through and achieve a what's called a halftone effect. These are all abstract principles. Once again, I could do a whole webinar just on the printing process of comics. If somebody were paying me, maybe I would, but I digress. Neil Adams used the mezzotint after this on many of his most famous greatest covers at DC Comics. This is December of 1970, two years later, March of 71, I believe, for this incredible image. Again, I'm sure Neil Adams colored all of these as well. Most people don't know it was Neil Adams who helped out the DC Comics production team by spicing up Jack Kirby's first New Gods cover and March of 71, with that mezzotint background, which made it one of the most memorable covers in Jack Kirby's career. And then, you know, just two months after this appeared, uh, uh, three months after, Neil Adams would use the same mezzotint effect on another's famous Batman stories, the debut of Ra's al Ghul in the background there in green. And in my Batman webinar next week, third of my Neil Adams Memorial webinars, we'll take a deep dive into this legendary issue. But so, yeah, the first real mezzotint Neil Adams cover was this one, and it just blew our minds. And then, of course, he opened up the issue. And at the end of the last issue, Tiny, the circus strongman, was shot in Dead Man's Place, and he couldn't save him. So... He goes inside that Tiny's body to try to heal him from the bullet wound. And I believe Neil Adams wrote this story as well, The Call from Beyond. And by juxtaposing the black and white art to represent dead man on the interior of Tiny, trying to heal him and then the full color exterior reality this brings to mind an epic series he would do three years later at marvel comics on this famous issue of avengers in which ant-man shrinks down and goes into the character, the Vision's body, his android body. And Neil Adams takes us on an artistic tour de force of a miniature Ant-Man in the Vision's body. But he first did it in this incredible Dead Man issue. Wow. Again, we can stare at the beauty of these drawings for longer than we have. But I want you to notice in this top right panel, the realism of this medical scene. I'm assuming Neil had photo reference because through the magic of Keynote, I can show you the Ben Casey Sunday that Neil Adams probably first used that photo reference for. Now, whether Neil Adams colored these Sunday pages or not, I don't know. But it's interesting whoever did color it. And let's say maybe it was Neil Adams. The way he carries the pink and red <clears throat> in a stylized manner through the Sunday strip is really a, a very beautiful, sensitive color job. And it's something that he brought to his dead man work when you study this page and just marvel in each panel 
there's something to admire before we get to discussing the color, you know, the way he achieved the black and white, there's the white zipper tone on the horse figure to give it a ghostly aura. And look at the beautiful inking of the woman's face. And again, the, the daring spotting of blacks to put that much black ink on a woman's face and pull it off is one of the most difficult things to do in realistic comic art. But Neil, at the age of, you know, 27, is already a master of it. And then the stylized coloring. You know, folks, this is old school Ben Day dot coloring, cut by screens by women working at Eastern Color Printing in Connecticut somewhere. But somebody does the color guides for the women who cut the screens. And I believe Neil Adams colored these and they're just beautiful. How about this incredible image of Dead Man and the amount of pure drawing beauty Neil puts into a single panel to make us feel the height and the ornateness, ornateness, is that a word? Of that engraved door. I mean, I don't know what Neil was getting paid for these pages, but comp rates were notoriously cheap. So, man, he's not doing it for the money. Neil is having a blast, you know, drawing characters from below, looking up, the foreshortening, just again. And then the pacing as a storyteller. When you get to the bottom of this page and you turn it, and you turn it, okay, hopefully we didn't freeze. There we go. Another one of Neil's greatest double page spreads. Again, the beauty of the coloring. You know, it's not complex coloring, it's stylized. I mean, the center panel is light green and dark green. That's it, two colors. The top panel is two colors, blue and red. Zip a tone on that, on that face, again, for impact. And just the realism, the emotion, the expressions, and yet the stylization of the nightmarish figures. Just Neil Adams' art had it all. But while he was drawing these masterpieces, in his heart, Neil Adams was a Batman fan. He drew this when he was 10 years old. When he got to DC, he petitioned Batman editor Julius Schwartz to let him draw Batman. But in the spring of 68, while he's doing Dead Man, Schwartz had already committed to new Batman artists combining the writing seal of Frank Robbins and the artistic genius of Irv Novick. Folks, don't shoot the messenger. I didn't write this. But they were hailing Irv Novick as an artistic genius drawing Batman. So what did Neil do? He was shut out of actually drawing Batman in Batman. Well, this is not a picture of Irv Novick. It is a picture of the longtime DC editor, Murray Boltonoff, who plays a key role in Neil Adams' career. Why? Because bolted off, one of the titles he edited was the Brave and Bold team-up title, where every issue they would team Batman with another DC Comics character. And you can see that in this cover of Batman dated November of 67, right at the time Neil Adams starts at DC Comics doing Dead Man and other things, you can see the art by Andrew is no different than the Batman TV show, Batman, which had kind of dominated the look of the Batman comics even. Well, Neil Adams at the time was also drawing the Spectre, which will be the focus in my Adams Eclectica webinar on what would have been Neil's 81st birthday on June 15th. But probably at that time, you can tell by the early signature, he did this drawing of the two characters he was drawing for an early fanzine. Well, maybe he might have showed this to Murray Boltonoff because he, you know, knew that Batman was going to be teamed up with the Spectre. 
So even though Neil didn't draw the interior story, he drew the cover, which you can see in its black and white original state is just another beautiful study in the spotting of blacks for weight and dimension and shadow. And then you get the full color, of course, which brings everything to life. The following issue is another Neil cover. It's not one of his best. I believe the extreme angle of this leads me to believe this was a Carmine Infantino layout that Neil had to follow. The next issue of Brave and Bold, no Neil cover, but this is another DC journeyman, Bob Brown, who along with Irv Novick, that artistic genius was drawing Batman and Batman and Detective Comics. Another reason why Neil couldn't draw Batman. But Neil did convince Murray Bolton off to let him team up Batman with Dead Man and to let Neil draw the next issue. Well, there it is. This issue comes out in the summer of 1968, three months after the TV show left the air, thank God. We had never seen a Batman drawn this realistically. Again, the, the, the Adam West TV show Batman had so dominated even the comics. I mean, this is Carmine Infantino, but you can see the stylized eyebrows, the, the nose piece, the cartoony mouth even. I mean, we were not prepared for what I call the shock of the new. Most Batman fans who weren't reading Dead Man for some reason were stunned by the realism. You could feel the man in Batman. But those of us reading Dead Man, <clears throat> we had seen the realism of this image, so we were not surprised. But Bat Adams also showed us the bat in Batman more than any artist we had ever seen up until that time. He started drawing Batman's cape like a pair of bat wings. Now, Neil Adams, again, the student of comic history, he was going back to the 1939 Bob Kane Batman original, which often drew his cape like stiff bat wings. That's really early Batman. Look at the, the gloves as well. But what Neil Adams did was take that early Batman, but rendered it realistically. Remember, folks, the combination of realism and stylization is what made Neil Adams the shock of the new. There would be no dark night of today. There would be no Frank Miller dark night. There'd be no Tim Burton dark night if it wasn't for what Neil Adams did in one single issue in the summer of 1968. Again, by going back to the Bob Kane original like this, but rendering it realistically in 1970 like this, Neil Adams would simply become what I'm now calling, starting in next week's webinar, the greatest Batman artist of all time. So this is next week's webinar, folks. But let's get back to Dead Man. The following issue gave us this startling cover. Once again, Neil's mastery of anatomy, perspective, foreshortening. And just study the stylization of the inking on Dead Man's costume throughout. It's really just, once again, a masterclass in spotting blacks. Here's an alternate cover that Neil penciled and obviously was either rejected <coughs> by himself or by the editor, who at that time was Dick Giordano, who would become his future art partner. So inside this issue, dramatic splash page. And this is, again, another case of Neil using Zipatone effectively. And the ability to draw from underneath Dead Man's feet and pull off the perspective and the foreshortening, as well as just that beautiful inking on Dead Man's costume, 
and all those gorgeous highlights. Neil, at the same time he was doing Dead Man, was member doing covers. This is for Superboy and the Legion of Superheroes. And once again, the ability to draw underneath the feet, looking up. Unfortunately, this cover got rejected either by Neil or by the editor. And Neil ended up doing this cover instead. But back to Dead Man. And again, I want to believe Neil colored these because they're just colored beautifully. Look at the colors on this page, the design of it. It's another recapitulation of Dead Man's origin. Look at the way he poises Dead Man's figure in the lower left with Ramakrishna. He's kind of drawn slightly as a woman in that. Remember, it wasn't stated in the first issue that Rama was female. I think that's something Neil brought to the, to the storyline. Beautiful figure. And I mean, just again, every panel is just a little perfect piece of storytelling. The stylization on the upper right, the coloring. Well, what can I say, folks? It's just another beautiful Neil Adams penciled ink page. And then he gives us the payoff of the cover with this incredible double page spread. But this time it's the girl with dead man inside of her taking her over doing the exact same somersault that Neil gave us on the cover. So how about that, folks? It's almost like a magician with a sleight of hand. He shows us this cover and then gives us that interior. Ah. Finally, we get some kind of new thing with the hook. We're back. You know... I said in my intro before we started recording that Dead Man was very much like the TV show The Prisoner, Patrick McGowan's famous secret agent deconstruction that only had 17 one-hour episodes and concluded with a very controversial final episode, the first of its kind. You think The Sopranos and Lost had controversial endings? Well, Dead Man functioned like that. Over the course of, I think there were 13 issues maybe that Neil Adams drew, each story was its own unit of storytelling, but there was this overarching storyline of the hook as his assassin and dead man trying to capture him. Well, in this issue, we're introduced, yeah. Oh, there's another color hole that Adams was paying homage to in his own way with this cover. Great splash page figure. Again, how about that daring coloring choices of the pink purple in the foreground? The beautiful grease pencil type hook illustration. Again, graphically, this art is working on so many literal levels as you go back. And then the combination of stylization in the upper left corner and realism everywhere else is just makes this a masterpiece. How about this sketch? Early signature. I bet you Neil Adams did this first and then maybe adapted it for that cover. That This issue also introduces us to famous villain of Neil Adams, the sensei. Now, whether this was done before or after he makes his comic book debut in this issue of Dead Man, as we see drawn here on yet another pretty incredible page of Dead Man, penciled and ink by Neil. Look at the perspective in the lower left panel, how Neil Adams draws Dead Man's foot from below as it would be perfectly poised in midair at that angle. And then the combination of realism and stylization in the bottom right close-up of Dead Man at his wit's end. Study those brush strokes on his cheeks, on his mouth. And again, no pupils, he doesn't have eyes. And yet you feel the emotion of that dialogue. And this is a story, by the way, Neil Adams wrote. 
he kind of he was the showrunner of Dead Man. He was, you know, based on that initial drawing I showed you with all the notes, he was Dead Man's auteur, no matter who was writing the story. Once again, Neil brought a realistic fighting style to comics. He studied martial arts, Neil. He knew how punches landed, kicks, judo chops, stuff that we see in modern cinema and modern comics. But again, Neil's doing it on the two-dimensional printed plane. And as Robert Crumb would say, folks, it's only lines on paper. But man, look at the aching of Dead Man's body in the bottom right. Ah, then you get this great page. Dead Man can't enter the Sensei because he's blocked by the Sensei's power. The psychedelic stylization of the middle left panel. And then Adams does a beautiful high contrast chariotscuro. <coughs> Uh, inking effect in the middle right panel and the startling. Adams loved the color green, man. You can see it in this page. And once again, the monochrome of the dead man and the pinkish red in the foreground with the, the hues of green in the background, just simple stylization. But you can feel, look at the lines Neil draws around dead man's fist. They're very subtle. But you know what he's indicating, that dead man's hands are shaking in frustration because you're reading the dialogue in his thought balloon. And Neil Adams, as the perfect illustrator, is literally illustrating that dialogue to make you feel the dialogue. That is the greatness of Neil Adams in a nutshell. And then you get this psychedelic swirling page of dead man confronting Ramakrishna. And just once again, you go from realism to stylization to realism. It's just a seamless mixture that Neil Adams pulls off, especially in the bottom panel. Answer me, was this your gift to me, an eternity of frustration? When he learns that the hook was just Using him as target practice. There wasn't a master scheme. And then the final panel. Once again, using white zipatone to make Dead Man's figure appear ghostly compared to the solid black of the foreground. Knowing where to spot the hook shadow to make the yellow foreground feel like a surface. There's a physicality to Neil's artwork because of his knowledge of where shadows fall. The combination of great type design to make you feel that perspective. And the psychedelia of Neil's background to make you feel dead man's emotion. Of course, once again, DC Comics made him share. I happen to like that house ad for Johnny Double. That was one of those Jack Sparling one shots. I loved it. Very film noir and comic book form, but I digress. Now, you know, a couple of years later, when Neil would do his famous drug issues of Green Lantern, Green Arrow, which of course in my Green Lantern, Green Arrow webinar, I believe that comes after the Marvel years. We'll be discussing this in depth, but the famous drug overdose scene has a combination of Neil's realism, his foreshortening, his perspective, the graphic decision to keep the foreground characters in black and white to heighten the emotion of the fact that the guy died. So Neil puts the figures in black and white to represent death and life. The guy above him is alive. But then the psychedelic background of the other addict realizing through his highness, get it, highness, that is addict, but he's dead. And that's why you feel this image. 
But again, three years earlier, Neil, you felt it here. And then we get the following issue with another pretty awesome cover by Neil. Is that Ramakrishna at long last? The female goddess. Could it be? As we open up the issue, another beautifully drawn panel. Talk about a splash page. You can feel that body's weight and how it's going to hit that water. And just again, another masterpiece of pure drawing to make you feel that perspective. The motion lines on the trapdoors, on the body, that's cartooning, folks, but it's Neil Adams combining that with his realism. And then the story deals with Dead Man finally tracking down Ramakrishna through the hook to India. And in this classic sequence, you really feel him hitting the ground. Oh man, that ground's hard. It feels, feels. Yes, on this page, Neil's mastery of anatomy, foreshortening, stylization, the shading he puts on dead man's arms from below gives those arms depth and weight and dimension. In that first panel, I can feel that's because you, the reader, can feel that dialogue because you're identifying with dead man, the expression on his face, no pupils, yet you feel his joy in feeling. The ability to draw a fist crunching grass in his grasp is just another masterclass in realistic drawing, and it makes you feel the dialogue. I live, I'm alive. The irony of Dead Man, the greatness of Dead Man, was that he was more alive than any other comic character, really, up to that point. That's why Marv Wolfman wrote that letter. Ah, then we're greeted by, obviously, the guardian of Ramakrishna, who Dead Man engages in a brief fight and defeats him. And then he ventures, like Dorothy and the three characters meeting the Wizard of Oz. Dead Man is finally going to meet Ramakrishna, face to face, very biblical. And what do we get in this bottom panel? But if you look closely, this is a famous or infamous panel. But this is Neil Adams tipping his hat to Jim Steranko, three years his elder. He got to Marvel Comics, you know, a year and a half before Neil got to DC and set it on fire. And those letters, if you look at them long enough, it says, hey, a Jim Steranko effect. Ha, I don't know if I noticed it at the time. I think I found out about this way later. And then you turn the page. And what we're getting, the culmination of the Dead Man Saga after a year of finally reaching Ramakrishna is really the 1968 equivalent of what debuted that summer, Stanley Kubrick's masterpiece, 2001, and the Stargate sequence that actor Keir Dullier as David Bowman experiences at the climax, finally confronting the monolith the epic of the greatest, one of the greatest movies of all time, is something akin to this issue of Dead Man meeting Ramakrishna and Neil Adams going all psychedelic on us. We hadn't seen this all year since Jim Steranko did it six months earlier. And then we turn this page, and I'll build for you the following page, as you follow the narrative of dead man confronting the female goddess Ramakrishna, each panel ca <coughs> carries the narrative 
in a stylized manner. But as you can see, if you start squinting your eye, by the time we get to the final panel, squint and you can see dead man's hidden head. Remember the hidden head from Ben Casey? Well, Neil Adams remembered it and incorporated it into one of his most famous pages of his dead man run and of his entire career. You turn the page and you got this image. Again, the combination of dead man's realism with this very kind of photographic woman in the background. Now, again, about six months earlier, Jim Steranko did this panel in Nick Fury, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Now, in my book, The Silver Age of Comic Book Art, I create a double-page spread where I show you Steranko's, in a sense, the stuff that preceded Neil by about six months or so, and Neil Adams paying homage. And here's what Neil said. When I did the Steranko effect panel in Dead Man, Adams said, I was tipping my hat to him. I never felt in any way competitive. What Steranko did at the time had almost no relationship to what I did. We weren't trying to do the same thing. I felt we were a community. Like Steranko, I was somebody with a reasonable knowledge of things that were common outside of comic books. Suddenly stepping into the field and bam, slapping everybody in the face. Steranko was definitely a graphic illustrator. His goal was to create new and impactful images graphically. He was looking to punch you in the face. That came from Kirby. I was coming from a more traditional background and direction. I tended to do a better drawing. He decried realism except where it related to graphics. Graphics were not my only focus. They weren't his only focus either, but they were certainly overpowering. I was doing many other things, level after level. I was thrilled with the page, with the opportunity to experiment, as was Steranko. He was, in some ways, much more aggressive. He was also very aware of the modern world. His work says, in effect, wake up, everybody. Don't you know we're here? And then a quote by Steranko. Neil Adams is doing work that's probably unsurpassable. I'm a great admirer of all of his proceedings. I think Neil's the most talented of the newcomers in the business. Neil did the Ben Casey strip for years and years, so he's got three times as much more drawing time in than I do. But as a comic artist, he's very exciting, doing a lot of imaginative things. And that's why I kind of end this page the way we began it. And that's the final, second to last page of the story as Neil says goodbye to Taj in Nanda Parbat, as it was called. And he leaves and there's the female of the story, Lotus. And she, I forget her story, somehow she's also held in Nanda Parbat. That's, where, that's the only place where, where these ghosts of Ramakrishna's are real. I guess I should have said that up front. But when you turn the page, dead man leaves, and then the bad guy says, you want to leave? All right, you're out. Next, the balance of power. Well, little did we know at the time, again, great, DC. Thanks for the Kurt Schaffenberger illustrated ending. But... Little did we know this would be the last issue of Dead Man by Neil Adams. In the last couple of months of 1968, the next issue of Strange Adventures would look like this. Another Neil Adams cover, but now it's called Adam Strange Adventures. Get it? Adam Strange, Earth's first spaceman. Now, this is legitimately a pretty great Neil Adams cover, but what happened to Dead Man? No explanation. The story just ended. Well, this is April of 1969. Later that year, remember Brave and Bold, the Batman team-up issue? Neil hadn't drawn it since, uh, I mean, he had been drawing it all the past year. 
Well, issue 86 would be his last issue. I think he did eight issues in a row since the first track of the, but once again, we're given an image of Batman, a, a realism that, you know, not often seen. In fact, we haven't seen it since his, since his first dead man team up a year before in the summer of 68. So here we are a year later. How about this splash page, folks? And how about Neil Adams' original pencil thumbnail sketch that became the title page of the sketchbook that I did on Neil? This is the actual cover because DC Comics wanted Vanguard, the publisher, I think, to pay 40000 to use Batman. So my title page was originally the cover. But the sketchbook, if you've never seen it, all the text is by Neil talking about the sketches that I edited from conversations I recorded with him, showing him every sketch I chose for the book, along with its comic book published panel counterpart. And it's really a primer on the art of sketching. Here's a page with Batman and Dead Man. Look at Neil. I don't know of any great painting that didn't start with what they call thumbnail sketches, wash drawings, preliminaries. They're always smaller and sometimes they're on the side of the canvas. That's really the proper way to do it. And look at how those thumbnails eventually became one of these great pages in the second Batman Dead Man team up, which we're going to look at more in depth in next week's Batman webinar. But you can see where Neil Adams recapitulates for the readers the past events that happened already in the last Dead Man issue from nine months earlier, or maybe a year earlier. And look at Neil's thumbnail sketch for that page. This is only about four inches tall by three inches wide. And look at this thumbnail sketch which Neil turns into this drawing. He really gives us the feeling of spaciousness when he returns Dead Man to his original milieu as a circus acrobat. Great page there. Motion, nice Batman too at the bottom there. Anyway, Batman Dead Man team up to track down the sensei and in this beautiful sequence in the snow, Adams using Zipatone makes the figures of Batman <clears throat> very ghostly indeed. Look at that panel on the right, pure Zipatone of the figures. Right? The Batman on the left, just the cape. And the final page of the story. I don't know all the answers, Batman. I just know that I'm still dead, yet I exist. And the only place I can be further harmed is here in Nanda Parbat. That's one of the reasons I'm going back to being a ghost. And that's how the story ends. The other reason that I've got something to prove to myself and to a character called Ramakushna. A silent figure trudges eternally down the mountainside even now planning a fitting revenge for his tormentors, Batman and Dead Man, never the end. And thank you, DC, for the Matchbox ad. The next time we would see Dead Man would be in 1970, the following year. <clears throat> in the pages of Aquaman? How is Dead Man interacting with Aquaman? Well... Bottom line is, it's a bit of a story, but Dick Giordano was editing Aquaman, and he had also edited Dead Man, and him and Neil Adams were becoming fast buddies and friends and artistic partners. But he wanted to do something special, and they came up with this Dead Man-Aquaman crossover. Well, the lead story was drawn by the Aquaman artist Jim Aparo, but Neil Adams ended up writing and penciling and inking and coloring three seven to nine page backups 
in each issue. So he's writing, penciling, inking, and coloring. And man, this is 1970. This is Neil at his early peak. And it doesn't even, I forget what the story's about. It doesn't really matter, does it? When the art is this gorgeous. But yeah, it concerns Aquaman's evil brother, Orm. Is that his name? And he's the ocean master. But man, how about the beauty of the top panel of Dead Man jumping into that nice, little water scene with the bottom panel of dead man in another kind of psychedelic background, the use of Zipatone and, you know, the close up of Orm's face in the center right panel is just Neil at his foreshortened, you know, angular best. Once again, the use of Zipatone in the top three panels to get that interdimensional effect. The beauty of Neil's anatomy, the great gluteus maximus on dead man. Come on, folks. You got to love. I, I, you know, I'm an avowed heterosexual, but I've stared at dead man's ass and that top right panel uh, because of the beauty of the drawing, the torque of the body. That's Neil Adams, the student of realism. Whether he had photo reference or not, man. And the ability to draw a dead man from below in the center panel. Just great. And there's the final page in this first installment. Once again, DC, well, maybe it's not that obscuring, putting its yearly publishing information that it legally has to do for mail order reasons or something like that. By the way, the cover artist for these is the great Nick Carty. And at the time, 1970, he's doing some of his greatest covers ever, this being one of them. So here's the next Dead Man installment. Again, I'm gonna assume Neil Adams colored these as well because they're just beautifully colored. How about that figure of Dead Man? And just the, the courage to draw a figure from that angle and pull it off and not make it about staring at dead man's ass because the feeling of the feet and the legs really makes you feel that swing on a two-dimensional plane folks i know i'm running a little long but that's because i'm waxing poetic ad nauseum and i hope you're enjoying the, the sights as I kind of narrate you through these incredible pages. Neil always drew beautiful women and sensitive human interaction and emotion. But really every panel is just a beauty. How about that stylized coloring in the final panel, the foreshortening, the inking, the shape? <coughs> The shading, okay, there's the house ad at the bottom, a Nick Cardi Teen Titans cover. But yeah, isn't it weird that, that DC had this policy, man. In between the threesome that was the Aquaman backup series, all of a sudden, Dead Man appears in Challengers of the Unknown. What the? They had been created by Jack Kirby like 10 years earlier in the late 50s while he was at DC Comics for a few years. By 1970, Neil Adams had been, he must have loved Kirby's Challengers, so he's doing new covers for them while he's doing covers for almost every other DC title in 1970 with their funky new costumes. Maybe Neil designed those costumes, I don't know. But what's going on? How, how is Dead Man interacting with the challengers of the unknown? Well, does it really matter when we're really talking about the art? But the story was written by Denny O'Neill. And you can see the art is split up between the panels and pages that Neil did and the journeyman comic artist George Tuska did on the other pages. So you can see... That's either 17 or 19 pages in. Neil takes over the art, pencils and inks, and probably colors. 
great dead man figure in the upper left. Nice. Again, you know, neo penciling inking is not as common as you think. You know, a lot of his DC work was inked by Giordano and others. But Neil always said when I worked for him, I asked him once, why did you only ink some issues, not others? He goes, Arlen, I always made the time to ink the stories that were special. Or I think that he loved the character, you know, he liked the idea that nobody was gonna touch Dead Man. That if they were, if DC Comics was gonna allow Dead Man to live on in cameos, that Neil Adams would still draw them. So after this Challenger story appeared, we have the trilogy finale, another beautiful Nick Cardi cover. Interesting splash. Again, look at the psychedelic distortion of Dead Man's arms in panel one. Again, the use of Zipatone, you know, limited coloring, lighting, and pure drawing. And in fact, if you look at this figure of Dead Man at the top, with the classic feeling of raw emotion, that's the figure that I used in this double page spread in the Neil Adams chapter, my Silver Age book, that focuses on Dead Man. And you can see all the images I chose for this spread are ones that we've seen earlier in the webinar. Nice center panel of Dead Man, great face. Yeah, you can feel that snap, can't you? There's Jim Aparo's artwork on Aquaman in a jam page where the two storylines cross over. And the final page, nice figure of Dead Man in the center panel. A lighting, I believe, would be the right word. And then the final panel, just beautiful Dead Man figure in repose. Neil's way with women, and he could draw animals too. The next time we would see Dead Man would be in 1971, a year after this. Remember this cover, the great mezzotint introduction of Ray Shal Ghul? Yeah, Dead Man's not in this story if you're a Batman fan, right? Ah, but if you're a Batman fan, you would know in this great full page image where Batman leads Ra's al Ghul and his manservant onto a Himalayan trip to find Nanda Parbat or whatever the story was about, etched into the mountainside, everybody said, that's Dead Man. And I think Neil confirmed that that was Dead Man. That was his little homage just to remind everybody that Dead Man lived in a way. Later that year, 1971, the next time Neil Adams would draw Dead Man would be this image coming from DC's flagship team-up title, Justice League of America. Look at the style DC used in the late 60s, early 70s of limiting the, the cover art and having to put in the faces and all what's called the trade dress elements. But what was, Neil had been drawing covers for JLA the past couple of years, but never the interiors until word got out that Neil Adams penciled and inked and again, probably colored four pages, including this spectacular splash page of the sensei. Look at it in black and white as best resolution as I could find. Just a masterpiece of pure drawing, penciling, inking, application of Zipatone to its full impact. And then the coloring is just really spectacular. Just the choice of the purple to offshoot the orangey skin is just beautiful. How about this page in black and white? 
Remember, he only did four pages, but man, this is 1971, folks. This is Neil Adams at his penciling and inking prime and how it looked in color. And this panel, believe it or not, of Dead Man rising out of Aquaman's body is the last time Neil Adams would draw Dead Man in a DC comic for years. We did not know it at the time. By the way, look at the fourth page. And really, it's just two beautiful drawings of Batman. I mean, the face on the right is just one of Neil's Batman icons. And then, of course, we're left with a great shot of the sensei with, again, the zipitone right where you want it. So this is 1971. Throughout the 70s, Neil Adams would only draw Dead Man in various convention sketches, some of which would be turned into posters. This was a very limited edition poster. I don't know exactly when the sketch was, but I'm gonna say it's from the, by the look of that signature, again, this is probably, gotta be early 70s, you know, 71, 72 maybe. I used it years later for the cover of Comic Book Marketplace, now defunct. I got Bill Sienkiewicz to color it on the computer because inside was my first major article slash interview with Neil called the DC Years. You can find this issue on Neil Adams' website for sale because I think they bought a number of copies. And then years later in my Silver Age book for the opening of Neil Adams' spread, I ghosted behind the type a black and white line art version of that very same poster. Here's a great sketch from 1972. Neil Adams put the date there. Interesting that it would be in red marker with black. Never saw that before, but again, beautifully drawn. Here's another one with a kind of a red, reddish brown marker with black as well. Folks, look at the difference in signatures. Again, 1972 on the left, the one on the right is probably from a few years later. The next time we would see Dead Man would be, what? In National Lampoon, the January 73 issues, The Adventures of Dead Man? In National Lampoon? Yes, The Adventures of Dead Man. Special Orange's issue. Published by Deceased Comics. Look up there, a cornice has fallen off that building. No, a window washer slipped. No, it's Dead Man. What the, says the, the bank robbers. Written by Henry Beard, famous National Lampoon writer. Supposedly at the time he came up with this, he did not know much about comics. Didn't know that a character called Dead Man did exist. Didn't know that Neil Adams had drawn him when he said we should get Neil Adams to draw this. Well, it's actually credited to Dick Giordano's pencils with Neil Adams inks. So basically it's some cockamamie story where yes, indeed, cops actually use a dead man to help them in their fight against crime. Again, you know, it's prime Neil, it's penciling and inking, but he did a lot of stuff for National Lampoon that I'm going to go into in my Neil Adams Eclectica portion of the Memorial Webinar. It's the last one on June 15th. The next time in the 70s we would see Neil Adams draw a, bat, a, draw a dead man would be this calendar, which featured, yes, two of Neil's his first two DC superhero characters, Dead Man and the Spectre. So starting in the 70s, other DC artists <coughs> would get to draw Dead Man. Starting in 1970, 71 and Brave and Bold, you got this 
Nick Cardi cover, but the interior was drawn by Aquaman artist Jim Aparo. And it's significant, his work on Dead Man. Also, in the 70s, he was drawing Phantom Stranger, and there was a team up with Dead Man. This is from 1973. The first DC artist to draw Dead Man, other than Neil Adams, did it in 1972, a year earlier. Yes, Jack Kirby was kind of mandated by DC publisher Carmen Infantino to spruce up sales of his faltering fourth world line. Team up the forever people with Dead Man. What the? Again, that's a whole nother story. But it's interesting that it would be through Jack Kirby that Dead Man would kind of revive in the 1980s when Kirby did his final project for DC called Superpowers, which was kind of a crossover event of the whole bunch of heroes, as you can see, and villains in the DC line. Well, you don't see Dead Man here, but yes, the first action figure of Dead Man was done in the 80s because of superpowers. Now, that drawing of Dead Man was taken from this circa 1984, I'm going to say, pinup page drawn by the great DC superhero artist for many decades, uh, Garcia Lopez, Jorge Garcia Garcia Lopez. And maybe it was this particular drawing and this revival of Dead Man via superpowers that brought Neil Adams back to Dead Man by doing this pretty awesome drawing for a 1985 house ad announcing the first ever collected reprint series of all of Neil's Dead Man. And Neil would do new covers for them. Now, I was working in continuity at the time. This is May of 85, but that's when it was published. But I remember preparing this and it had to be six months earlier. And I did the lettering, believe it or not. That's my lettering. Yeah, that's my little claim to fame. Neil let me do the lettering on this first of the reprint editions. I also did the lettering on issue two. And you can see these are Neil's computer colored. No, this was pre-computer. What am I saying? And this is hand colored on what were called blue lines. And you can see what Neil was doing was revisiting the original Dead Man and doing kind of new versions of them. For this issue's back cover, he took that drawing of Dead Man and showed you in its entirety, which again is a pretty great drawing of Dead Man where you can feel the tension in him, which was his trademark. And then the other issues were um, reprints of his original covers. But for the final reprint issue, number seven, Neil gave us a wraparound cover of Dead Man and Nanda Parbat with Taj about to slice into him with a samurai sword. Well, maybe sales of this reprint collection signified to DC that, hey, we should revive Dead Man. Well, Neil Adams wasn't going to draw it. But remember Garcia Lopez from that 1984 pinup page. Yes, the first Dead Man series with Garcia Lopez doing his take on Neil Adams' Dead Man. And over the years and decades, the, the popularity of Dead Man would never die out, pun intended. And you can tell from the different logos of DC Comics over the years how many different artists, this is the great Mike Mignola of Hellboy fame, took their shot at Dead Man. Maybe one of the most outre, if I'm using that word correctly, is the great um, Kelly Jones' Dead Man, which really abstracted Dead Man into a dead man, uh, an abstract skeletal figure that in the modern era 
has proven to be one of the most popular takes on Dead Man. The great Alex Ross, the painter, used that image of Dead Man in his famous Kingdom Come comic series. They made action figures of the skeletal Dead Man. That's how popular this version is. In fact, Dead Man's become a popular character in the modern era with various figurines. Yes, very cartoonish. Speaking of cartoons, he's been animated, both in a cartoony version, semi-cartoony, stylized realism. Yeah, that kind of Bruce Tim model. This looks like Batman Brave and Bold animation. And then all the action figures you can get now on Dead Man and the, and the statuettes. I mean, back in the day, we would have died for this stuff. And once again, look at how many figures, based on the DC logos and how they've changed over the years, this is how popular Dead Man has been. Look at the logo in the bottom left. Yep, and all various versions. Look at this DC logo from about 15 years ago. Another Dead Man. In every iteration of DC Comics since, somebody has done their take on Dead Man. Bernard Chang, great artist. This is most recent. How about this one? It, it looks like a movie poster, but it's a comic book series. Justice League Dark. And how about the great Lee Bermeo doing his drawing that they made into a three-dimensional action figure sculpture? Speaking of three dimensions, people are cosplaying as Dead Man in this modern 21st century Comic-Con cosplay age. And don't even ask me what the heck this is. But this is the kind of stuff you find on the internet. Like, yeah, you can now have a shirt with the distinctive, not Daredevil, not DD. Single D on red is Dead Man. And what has Neil Adams been doing in the 21st century while everybody else was doing their take on Dead Man? Well, remember the slipcase edition circa 2005. And that looks like this. Again, it's the best single collection of all of his Dead Man work. DC Comics, ever since then, would find different ways to reprint the Dead Man collection, paying homage and using Neil's actual art. And Neil himself, in the last 20 years before he passed away, was hired to do homages to his own work. How about this, using Deathstroke instead of Dead Man? And Neil drawing comic industry professionals in the background, like the first Dead Man cover. In the last 20 years of his life, Neil would take sketches from the 70s and turn them into modern full color renderings like this. These are just some of the beautiful Dead Man commissions, full color sketches, different mediums he would experiment with. You know, this beautiful sketch, this could be from the early 70s, it could be from 10 years ago. I don't really know for sure, but that just shows you Neil's just incredible pure drawing ability that you can see on this page. Now, is this a Dead Man comic book page of modern Neil Adams art? showing us that the guy could still draw like a mother effer in his 70s, which is when he did this. In fact, DC made the announcement. Comics legend Neil Adams returns to the character that made him a star. Folks, this is like three years ago, maybe. And follow the captions there. Dive into an all-new investigation of the DC Universe's dark side, written and illustrated by Neil Adams. Dead Man collects the entire six history minutes here. So, yes, one of Neil's last series for DC Comics a couple of years ago 
was a six issue series of dead man stories in which Neil basically wrapped up all of the plot lines and the things he had been doing with dead man for years. And each cover was just an in your face, Neil Adams on spinal tap 11 and the interiors was Neil really just showing to the world dead man is still my character and i am his master and i will render him any time at any age i can both pay homage to my own work and create new images that are as beautifully drawn yeah a little more exaggerated a little more cartoony but still the same characters the same self homages that Neil was making in the last decade of his life. Images like this were Neil getting to the heart of what made Dead Man tick and bring it into the modern era using modern printing and computer coloring. How about this cover? Very abstract, but if you look at the nose closely, yes, that's the Spectre. That's Neil Adams doing a psychedelic combo. Now, we all know who this character is, right? There's another cover. This was Neil doing this for posterity. You know, he passed away two weeks ago. And this is the work Neil wanted to kind of leave us with. Was, you know, in his late 70s, paying homage to the work that made him a star and making beautiful new images. He returns to all of his beloved characters. He returns to Nan the Barbat. And how about this image? I mean, this is Neil in your face. Now, if this looks familiar, yeah, remember the beginning of the webinar? I showed you this great image that Neil did early on based on the signature. One of Neil's greatest dead mans showing Neil coming full circle at the end of his life. So ladies and gentlemen, that brings us to an end. I know I ran long, but thank you for being here at the second of my Neil Adams Memorial webinars that I felt compelled to do as somebody who loved him, loved his work, thought of him as a father figure. So folks, next week, I hope to see you here, same bat time. Same bat channel for my Neil Adams web memorial webinar on Batman. If you go to my website, arlenschumer.com, the separate pages carry all of my interests, like the comic book history page, where you can uh, find out more about my book and how to get assigned and sketched in copy. I run a Facebook group on the Silver Age of comic book art, one on just Jack Kirby's work, and of course, one on Neil Adams who influenced my drawing style the most, like a whole generation doing comic book art, but for advertising and editorial usage. And one of my specialties is turning people into superheroes and keeping the photographic likeness. I'm also linked to the, the commercial site, T Public, where you can get over 125 of my illustrations and every knickknack, gigaw, and application you can think of. My visual lectures and webinars page linked to both my YouTube channel and my Vimeo channel that house all of my recent webinar video, videos of my webinars and my older live lectures pre-pandemic. My Vimeo channel has all of my webinars that have copyrighted material that YouTube's lawyers flag, but Vimeos don't. So you can see Twilight Zone, James Bond, Bruce Springsteen, and others uh go to that and then if you go to the events blog i always post all of my comings and goings with all of the url links that you'll need to join each webinar so again folks i hope to see you next week for the greatest batman artist of all time and thank you again for coming to this one bye bye folks i hope to see you further on up the road Thanks for attending this presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. 
And please remember to click the subscribe or follow button on your platform screen to be notified of all of my upcoming pop culture presentations. And visit my website, arlenschumer.com, to sign up for my newsletter, too. Until next time, I'm Arlen Schumer. Bye-bye.